John 1, 14 to 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and he cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Let's begin in verse 14, okay? So what we have here in verse 14 is we have this, this state, okay? And so in the previous context, right, we looked at the, how the word, the word created the world, okay? And, and clearly in the preceding context, we have the word is God, the second person of the Trinity. We've already established that from our study in John 1, 1 to 5, okay? And so that's second person of Trinity. We talked about how he is the, the life giver, light, and this is spiritual light, right? He's the true light. He's the life giver, sustainer. So when we look at 14 to 18, we cannot ignore these fundamental truths, okay? And then we have new. We have a new truth that's going on here. The word not only is the second person, the eternal God, the eternal son, not only is he the one that gives life and sustains life, not only is he the one that gives spiritual light, enlightens all of us, right? This is the phenomenal truth. So all of the, the first part is he's above, he's above, right? He's over us. And then look at, the, look at this here. The word became flesh. And so this is describing the word becoming a man. So incredibly powerful. We have several passages to consider. We have Matthew 1, 18 to 25. We have Luke chapter two, verses one to 20. This is, this is real, a, a real person. So this is, he is both God and man, 100% of each. It is so interesting how in other places, right? It'll talk about in, in Galatians four, Galatians four and Romans two, God sent his son, right? It's, it says that, but notice here that the accent is on the word. The word became flesh. Let's think about that for a second. And what is the significance? What is being accented when it's describing the word becoming flesh versus the son becoming flesh? Or, or something else. What's the, what's the significance here? Let's think about this for a second. Maybe someone can comment. What's the significance of the word becoming flesh? Okay, so we could say number one, God became flesh. That's good. What does the word symbolize? Looking at the Old Testament, looking at the idea of the word, what we've taught, we've taught before about what the word symbolizes. So, so you're saying the word of God. So we could say God's power. So if the eternal becomes flesh, looking at maybe suff suffering, servant type, what's that, what's that other word that we use? If, 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 if God, if, if you are becoming, if you are becoming an ant, if you are becoming a, if you're becoming a servant, what, what is that? How can we, what do we describe that as? Are you going living up or down? Sacrifice. Yeah, living, living sacrifice. sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's. So there is this idea of we 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 can refer to his earthly ministry as as a humiliation, or we can speak of humility. 
And we're going to see this later in Ephesians 2, this idea of what Henry was saying, the eternal God becoming flesh. We can never see, God can never reveal to us his nature, his characteristic of humility, except through the Son. Does everyone understand that? You will never see God's eternal humility except through the incarnation. How many times have we had the question, why would God permit sin in the world? Well, one thing, without sin, we will never see his humble example. We will never see his humble character that he's called us to to emulate. So we can think of this in the incarnation, the humility of God. What else? There's so much here, okay? Picking up on God's word, thinking about this here, right? God's word in the Old Testament, this can also be referred to as scripture, correct? And in scripture, the written word, right? This is written. In the Old Testament, in in the Pentateuch, the law, Diba, God revealed who he is. I am the Lord the one who saved you, and here are my commands. So in, so in the Old Testament scripture, we can think about God's, God reveals his person, who he is, the Lord, and his will. But again, up until now, this is being mediated through Moses, right? <laughs> it's deficient. It's deficient from the standpoint of, of the fallenness of man who's doing the mediation, okay? It's not deficient in God's purpose. It's not deficient in what God has revealed to us. It's deficient in that it's being mediated by a, a sinful man. Everyone tracking there with me? But there is in the Old Testament... God reveals his person and will next level, (laughs) next level, level up right now. God, God is now coming down and it's fundamentally person and will law, what God wants us to do, what what God wills of us. That's why Jesus is always saying, I've come to do my father's will. (laughs) Nothing more, nothing less. I have come to reveal the father to you all throughout the gospels. So this is like next level. It is so true that this, that as the son, he reveals God hundred percent. That's a different imagery, but here now, I guess what I'm trying to get at is next level scripture. Let me just write this down. Next, next level scripture if you can imagine that right they have the written torah and it's like next level i'm going to change that word to incredible incredible grace unmerited favor god sending his son to live with us we don't deserve it no one deserves it unmerited favor is going on right here okay excellent so we have here we can first describe this as a a state of what's happening the word became flesh. We can refer to this as the incarnation. We'll keep state, but as long as we understand that this is the birth, and so we can also think of this as an action because it's referring to the birth. And then he dwelt among us. Now, those of you who have studied this passage before, what is the significance of this word dwell? What's the Old Testament significance of this word? Anyone dwell, dwelling among us? Tabernacle. Ah, tabernacle, same word. Tabernacle. So you could say, and he tabernacled among us. So we're going to take a step back here. We're going to look really briefly at biblical theology. Big picture, okay? We have the garden. In the garden, God dwells with man. Diba, he walks with man. Man sins. Man is cast out from his presence. 
And we have God coming in the presence of Abraham, Jacob, but his presence, his presence is not yet made known, right? In a, in a, in a more permanent way. The next, he just comes and goes, he comes and goes, um, the burning bush. And then after he rescues them from, from Egypt, you have the presence of God among the people in the tabernacle, literally, and we're talking biblical theology right now. Okay. Everyone's tracking there with me. This is, this is biblical theology. Okay. And then the tabernacle is replaced with the temple, God's dwelling place. Now look at this here. And this climaxes in Jesus Christ. And the connection is, is here. <laughs> this is the connection. Does everyone see that? And so we can, we can clearly see that the tabernacle was the next, was the next, was the temple was the next step here. And, but we can look at the tabernacle, the tabernacle points to Christ. And so if it's pointing to Christ, it's also pointing to the temple. Okay. Is everyone tracking there? Everyone, everyone's with me there. So big idea is the idea that God is making himself a place to be with us. That's the whole point of the temple. That's the whole point of the tabernacle. Okay. And so when people will talk, so then let's get, let's get really big. Let's get, let's get really big eschatological. People will say that the temple is coming back. Whether or not the Jews build the temple is a totally different thing. Do you see how it would be so offensive to God for God to ordain? Okay, I'm, I'm tabernacling now with you in my son, right? And so here we can think of the, the church. The head is Jesus. The body is, is Christ. I mean, the body is the church. The head is Jesus. And the, and the connection here is through the spirit. So I hope you're seeing, this is big picture type stuff going on right here, okay? So do you see how, if, if regardless whether or not the Jews somehow swing it and, and they build a temple in, in Jerusalem, okay? Do you see how that's so offensive? And it just, what? Jesus is, Jesus is here. He's the, he's the temple. He's the tabernacle. He, he, he did the sacrifice once for all. He's the high priest, the one interceding for us. The, the church is his body. So this, I hope this brings on a whole new meaning to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. I would go back. We have a video on Ephesians 2, 18 to 22 in our Interpreting Ephesians series. I would go back and watch that again. And this is just, it should bring whole new meaning. The fact that Jesus is our tabernacle. He's tabernacling among us. It's, it's offensive to think about, oh, we're just going to bring back the temple. The physical temple was so deficient compared to what we have now in Christ. So deficient. Something to think about. Big idea, though, for us is that Christ is dwelling. God is dwelling among his people. Christology. Fundamental. Okay. Now look at this. And if you're going to say, Tim, ah, this, that you're going to, this is kind of, this is kind of ice. Maybe this could be ice to Jesus, Tim, because you know, that, that one word dwell one word. Um, I don't see the strength. You ready to go next level, next level here. Come on. We have seen <laughs> his glory. Where did the glory dwell? <laughs> In the OT, at the dedication of the temple, what happens? <laughs> the glory comes down and fills the room. <laughs> In the tabernacle, right? When the tabernacle is set up, the glory of God comes down. Let's, let's look at a parallel passage here. Let's go here. Was it Jesus himself in the tabernacle in the Old Testament? There could be debate. 
there could there could be debate on that. But what we can be sure of here is if we go to John chapter 1241. So let's go. If you can look over to your left, John 1241. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. So if, if we're looking at the broader context here, therefore they could not believe, again, for Isaiah said he has blinded their eyes and has hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. So this is a reference to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 and the commissioning of, I, of Isaiah, okay? But Isaiah sees the, the Lord high and lifted up, right? His train filling the temple, right? And then Isaiah says... <laughs> He saw his glory. He saw the his is not God the Father. The his is Jesus Christ the Son. So from this, if we accept, if we accept this paradigm here, Isaiah 6 is referring to the temple and Jesus' glory is there. Okay? then I think your question, we can answer that and say, yes, when the glory filled the tabernacle, we could see that as being the son's glory. And the, But this is not a son's glory against the father's glory. It's that both, the, it's one God, three persons. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? So it's not an, a, 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 a dichotomy. It is the accent, the presence of Jesus, the son, in the glory. Okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? It's accenting the, 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 the son's glory in the old Testament as well. The word we is the nation of Israel or the apostles. <laughs> Great question. This is the, this is the apostles. Let put, let's come back to that. Great question. The, 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 we is, is the apostles because it's in, Fundamentally, it includes John, John the Apostle. Yeah, so here, so here in Exodus 24, before the building of the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. So whenever you saw the glory of the Lord, the cloud, that was the presence of God. Okay. So you so if we're if we're acknowledging the presence of tabernacle, and then and then they say we have seen his glory, this is old testament reference to presence of god so it's not just the tabernacle imagery these two are 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 inseparably linked like a chain okay let's find another example here let me get an example where the 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 glory here we go here we go Exodus 40, 34. This is a good one here. Let's look at this right here. Exodus, Exodus 40, 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So look, glory and tabernacle. Okay. The two are connected. Come on. They could build the tabernacle. But it wasn't until God's presence came that there was, it was any value to them. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of the meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So this is Exodus 40, 34 to 35. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. The Lord himself now dwelling with us. But Diba, the glory cloud can come and go. <laughs> My goodness. Jesus is forever the God man. He is forever inseparably linked to us. So to me, is it related to the presence of God? Yeah, it is the presence of God. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. The presence of God. To see the glory is to see God himself. When you saw the cloud, they knew God was there on the mountain, in the tabernacle, in the temple. It's so sad in Ezekiel, the vision is the glory of, the, of God leaving the temple. And that is a terrifying thing when, 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 that, when that glory leaves. But thankfully, 
Christ has come to dwell among men. And so this is, this is the clarity here. This is the clarity, okay? What kind of glory is it? What kind? We're looking at kind, quality. The only son from the father. And we've already established these two. And, and what is this, this glory? You know, there is such an emphasis today on feeling and we should feel the presence of God. I'm not minimizing that. But look at, look at the focus here. Full of grace and truth, unmerited favor and eternal truth. So unbelievably powerful. Think about the assurance, the revelation. Now, people will talk about love, and there is love is present in the Trinity. It's it's fundamental characteristic. I'm not minimizing that. I'm not minimizing that. But here he doesn't say full of love. It's not an either or. And of course, within grace, there is this idea of love. So I'm not minimizing. But at the end of the day, the emphasis here is the fullness of Christ. He's full of grace and he's full of truth. And so if someone is trying to, you cannot reject. These two are inseparably linked. So people will talk about just having, just having love, just acceptance. Grace and truth are inseparable. And that's who Jesus is full of. My goodness. So here, what we're looking at right now is this right now, we are in the realm of fulfillment. Old Testament promise, New Testament fulfillment. Now look at this. We can say all this, but we want to know, is it reliable? Is the message reliable? Look here now. This here, who is the we? The Greek word here is so powerful. I would write this down. The, the best translation is like this. We ourselves, the verb is like reflexive. The focus is upon our action. We ourselves saw. This is eyewitness testimony. This is, this is Kuya Bull Boy territory here. We ourselves saw his glory. My goodness. So when we talk about glory, let's, let's define glory here, okay? Before we come back there, okay? So if we're, if, we're, if we're defining glory here, this includes, like we said, grace and truth. This also includes sign miracles. This also includes visible, eternal glory of the exalted risen Christ. So here, let's look at, so we did a search on glory. Okay, so let's look at John's gospel. So I'm going to, I did a word search. So I'm coming down here. Let's get down to, let's get down to, to John, to John's gospel. So, so the way that we would find out how he's, we can overall summarize it as grace and truth. But what, to what extent have they seen the glory of God? Let's look at the, the ways that they've seen the glory of God. Look at John, look at John 2.11. The first of these signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. So this is the miracle, right? The miracle of the water turned to wine. And he revealed his glory and the disciples believed in him. So the sign miracles revealed. So that's supernatural power. Coming down here, the one who speaks of his own authority seeks his own glory, but one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and there is no falsehood in him. So look at this here. Part of the glory of Jesus Christ is what he said here, the, the truth component. So someone, you can be sure someone is not doing the will of God or not, not right? The command is to do all to the glory of God, right? Do all to the glory of God. So you can... Take it to the bank. Someone who is lying ends justify the means type behavior or not being truthful, manipulating, being dishonest, 100%, they're not revealing the glory of God. God's glory is not being revealed, especially Christian leaders, right? And so the, 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 the ultimate is in Christ. God's glory is revealed 
in the complete absence of, of falsehood, only truth coming along here. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me. <laughs> so our glory only comes from God and the ultimate is Christ. So anyone who tries to get glory for himself, my goodness, you are already outside the realm of Christianity, right? That's why the one who exalts himself will be brought low. The one who humbles himself, God will exalt. So there's practical. This is true for us as well. We need to humble ourselves in the presence of God so that he will exalt us. If we exalt ourselves, we try to grab the positions, we will be humbled. Can we connect this on Revelation? Yeah. That 40 is the lamb. Yes. It's not say that. It's not say where it is the lamb and me. <laughs> it's the lamb alone. No, that's excellent. So here's the thing, though. The glory is also in the sacrifice. This is what I'm trying to get at. The humility also brings glory to Christ, right? Uh, we talked about this last week. When, when he is lifted up, the whole world will be drawn to him in his sacrifice, but, but if, if ever there was just, okay, this is just physical glory of, of serving others. This is just physical glory and signs. There is raw power, raw, visible glory coming from him. Isaiah said this, these things because he saw his glory. Look at the vision of, let's, let's go to the vision of Isaiah so that you can understand the power of, of Christ's glory, unadulterated power. Look at this here. Isaiah 6, listen to the word of the Lord. In the year that the King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Glory. And John's response is, woe to me. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. But for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And this glory here refers to Jesus Christ. Unfiltered. The sun, raw, incredible glory. The sun doesn't even compare. One other passage here, what they eyewitnessed, right? So it's not, again, just physical glory of what he's done. Christ's glory in the prophetic word. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Second Peter 1.16. Write it down. Let's write it down. Second Peter 1. 16 to 21 for we did not we did not follow cleverly devised this when we made known to you made known revealed the power and the coming of our lord jesus christ this transfiguration was a foretaste of the power and the glory of christ the power and the coming of the lord when we were eyewitnesses this is law courtroom assurance reliability when, we, when he received glory and honor from God the Father. My goodness. So, this, so, so Jesus' miracles revealed him. This grace and truth in his compassion and teaching ministry. In the sacrifice. And in, we, it wasn't just those. We saw his raw, unfiltered power and glory on the mountain. Incredible. This is the thing, okay? No, in the Old Testament, everyone saw and knew the glory of Almighty God the Father, the Lord, okay? This, this was not questioned, okay? This was not questioned. This is, this is that's, that's, that's good. But we haven't seen the Father. Okay, so the accent here is that 
We've seen the son. And, and the, the language is very specific, the only son. And so what's being accented here, Paul, is that if you've seen the son, you've seen the father. The, the, the father-son relationship, you know this, right? There is no difference. And so I, I'm not, I, I don't want to enter into, I don't want to enter into political debates or, or issues here, but I just, I, I guess maybe I, I hope that we can appreciate we can appreciate the, the struggle in the Philippines with Bong Bong Marcos, right? Because people cannot see the son except through the lens of the father. <laughs> whether you're for or against, whether you're for or against, I, 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 I don't want to go into those political debates because th that's not the point. The, the illustration is just that's why the, the feelings are so strong, maybe on either side, or you can appreciate because the son is like the father. So that's why the feelings are so malakas. They're so malakas. They're so strong. Okay. And it's even to a stronger extent in the Old Testament and in the, in the first century. And it's even to a stronger extent when you're dealing with kings. We're just dealing with presidents right now, elected officials. Can you imagine monarchies? Next level. If you've seen the son, you've seen the father. The son carries out the father's wishes. And so, Paul, there is incredible assurance in this truth. And the, the accent on the only son is because in, in John 1, 12 to 13, right, we are all called sons of God. <laughs> so let's come back here. So if we can come back here to, to John 1, 12, but all who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So powerful. And yet there is no comparison between us and Jesus Christ. And so here we're accented. This is not the revealing of the sons, <laughs> the family of God. This is the revealing of the only, the one of a kind, the unique son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Accent. I uh, have this illustration like Bong Bong and uh, his father. <laughs> we're, we're, getting we're, we're getting contextual now, baby. We're getting contextual now. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, okay, let's go on here. Let's go on here. Let's go on here. Again, I, I want to stress, I, there's various sides to this. That, that's The purpose is not to have a political discussion. It's just to illustrate. And it should give us assurance. Where other, whatever side you fall on, that illustration should give us assurance for to next level type degree for, for the sun. So notice here. So we have eyewitnesses. This is the 12 here. Eyewitness testimony, a hundred percent. Come on more eyewitness testimony. If ever there was, so Diba, Diba, you need, we could even, there's 12 here, but we would say this is one category of eyewitness testimony in the law for something to be true. You need at least two witnesses on the basis of two or three witnesses. Let everything be established. That was the, the, the old Testament law requirement. Okay. So we have one category here, the 12 apostles, disciples, you ready for this second John bore witness. Again, this is eyewitness testimony. Come on. So there is an accent here on the second category, the, the Old Testament prophet, prophetic category. We have seen his glory, number one. Number two, John bore witness about him. And he cried out, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me. So if we understand and recognize, and all, everyone in Jesus's day, accepted John as the prophet Elijah. John was the, the final OT prophet. He's, John is already fulfilling eschatology, right? And we can see this in Isaiah 40, verse 3. John is the, the voice crying in the wilderness, right? So already we're looking at 
fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, okay? But this is insane. So of all the prophets that have come before, John is like the climax. John is the climax, okay? And look at this here, baby. The one coming after me ranks before me. Jesus is better than me. <laughs> and then look at this. So even though Jesus, Jesus comes, Jesus is the one who comes after. He is before in preeminence. In time. In position. So this should call everyone. This testimony along should call all to believe. Jesus is the one to come. Jesus is the coming one. And then we have lastly here, we have ex explanation. This is, this is going to be, this is going to be the explanation. So this here is an explanation. Okay. So you could have, you could have the, the testimony. You can have the, the coming. So if I'm, if I'm preaching this, okay, I'm preaching one, two, three, come on right there. Three points. Boom, boom, boom. The coming of the word. Or, or you could, or you could connect it here. You could connect the testimony here. So you have the coming and then, um, here or or you can connect it there i mean there's there's different ways i i would i would like to to keep it i would like to split i would like to split it here if i was preaching this because of the connection because of this here the glory aspect i would want to keep this the coming of the word to dwell among men you could have three points so this is come on look at this this is so easy a B, C, right? One, A, this is John bore, wit uh, John bore witness. This is the, the witness, the witness, his position, right? And then C, content of message. Come on, look at that. Beautiful. That'll preach. And then we have the explanation. Okay, we got the explanation here, okay? From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. <laughs> so, so look at this. Look at this. So this is the source. This is the object. This is the action. Okay? So... So look at this here. We have two graces here, okay? We have two graces here, and, and everyone connects these two, okay? So we have uh, grace one, the law, and we have grace two. We have, so we have two here, okay? But notice here, look here, okay? So you can see dissimilarity. So there's dissimilarity. This is going to get to um, those of you who are struggling with covenant theology and dispensational and new covenant this thing is big here. Okay. You know, uh, maybe I'll get all converts. Okay. Maybe you won't be convinced, but so notice here. So there's grace upon grace or some, some translations will have grace. Uh, we'll have grace for grace, grace in place of grace, but there's so there's similarities and dissimilarities. So there's similarities and dissimilarities. Okay. So look here. And so number one, if we recognize grace and so, so there's two graces here, okay. At least two graces, um, grace upon grace. Okay. So we, so looking fairly in the context, the law, law is grace. Okay. Very fair. Okay. Jesus Christ is bringing grace and truth. Okay. So there is a there is a contrast here for sure. There's a, there's, there is a contrast going, going on here, okay? Now look at this. We have all received. So the we is clearly at this point referring to 
I would say at least church, especially picking up with the all church apostles, and then considering the law, this has to be also include Israel and Gentiles. Okay. And this is, of course, the, the condition is all the, the condition is all on faith. Does everyone see how the, the we has to be all of it? Because it's including the law, it's including grace and truth that Jesus is bringing, right? Everyone sees this. We're all we're all here, okay? You got it? Everyone's everyone's good so far? Okay, so the law is given through Moses. So Moses is the the mediator. And Jesus is also a mediator. So if we recognize the mediation, it's there. So explicitly, this is agent, okay? Agent, agency, agent, all right? So, so clearly here, Moses is the mediator of the Old Testament, Old Covenant. Moses is the mediator, okay? I think everyone has to agree with that, okay? And then, but if we recognize that Jesus is doing mediation here, then we have to see new covenant, right? Present, uh, the, the, the implication is the presence of the new covenant, okay? But notice this here. <laughs> we can suffer. So there's, there's clearly dissimilarity between the two, right? The, the law was given grace and truth came. Okay. And grace and truth must be, uh, eternal, right? Grace and truth is eternal, right? Everyone's tracking so far. Is everyone tracking? Everyone's seeing this picture being built. Okay. So we're building theology and I hope and see that you see this as clear. So, so, so we're getting there. Okay. So there's dissimilarity. There's dissimilarity between these two. Okay. But you can't say radical dissimilarity because they're defined fundamentally as grace, <laughs> right? You can't, they're both grace, okay? And more importantly, grace and truth is eternal. You couldn't sit there and say grace just shows up when Christ comes, right? You can't say that, especially since we've all received. <laughs> so there must be something going on that's bigger, that's similar and dissimilar. And so that's why we talk about, and this is not, the only place, and you'd have to look at other places, but you can see this clearly. You can see that there's a greater theme going on, the covenant of grace. So we'll talk about two administrations. Moses, Christ. But Christ doesn't just show up on the scene as if it's just there. We've already seen how many times the promise of Abraham is fulfilled in Christ. The promise of David is fulfilled in Christ. The law is fulfilled in Christ, right? He, he becomes a curse for us. The promise of Eve is in Christ. And so there must be this broader idea of continuity because look here, everyone is receiving grace and grace is only coming through Christ. Does everyone see that? So there is this similarity, old covenant, new covenant, but it's all one. It's all one. Do I have you convinced? <laughs> and so to look at this and see radical discontinuity is terrible. We need to see this in promise fulfillment categories, type, anti-type, we're just saying climax, climax, type, climax categories. And look at this here. The law was given through Moses, right? So, so looking here, the source of all of these things, look at this here. The ultimate actor is God the Father. God through Moses gives the law. God through Christ 
gives grace and truth. And grace and truth is even there before the law. <laughs> one, one actor, one actor. So what are your questions? Or maybe this makes sense. Let's take a pause. What are your questions or comments? Maybe the, the reason of this uh, grace upon grace, because in Moses, there's no salvation, but in Christ, there's a redemption. No, we have, no, there's, that's what I'm trying to say. You can't say that, Paul. The okay, grace okay. in place of grace means that salvation is with Moses as well. It's all the same. So, so think about this. So, so let's think about this. So, so one position will say, let's draw this out here. Okay. So I love mathematical diagrams just because it's helpful. Okay. So if we're thinking positive and negative, right? This is a, a graph. What many people will say, law, bad, grace, Christ, good. And I'm saying that is, that is, let me draw this down here as strong as I can. This is a, this is incorrect. What it should be here. You ready for this? Let's draw this again. Negative, positive. Law, good. Christ, better. All in the realm of grace. Do you see that? Thank you, thank you, sir. <laughs> but because there is such, if so, here's the thing: if you're just looking at these two things, you could maybe see, oh, this is positive and negative. There's that tendency. But when you look at the full picture, you can't have that. You have to remove this. It's all in relationship to what? Do you see what I'm saying? Is everyone tracking there with me? If we're just looking at, at these two relationships, yeah, there's a, there's a negative slope. <laughs> there's a negative, for those of you who know math, there's a negative slope there, right? Because you're just looking at these two as a contrast. But the big picture, the big picture is that it's all positive. It's all redemption. And then this fits perfectly. This, fit, this fits perfectly when you have a, a passage like Hebrews. Now, the faith is the assurance of things hopeful, hope for the conviction of things seen. For by it, <laughs> the people of old received their commendation. <laughs> they didn't receive their commendation by works. That, that would be this paradigm. They received it by faith. By faith, we understand the universe was created by the word of God. By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable offering than Cain. Faith is there from the beginning, my brothers. And as soon as we're talking about faith, as soon as we're talking about faith, we're talking about Christ. <laughs> and we're talking about Christ. We're talking about the covenant of grace, the system by which God saves all people of all generations of all time. So from a historic redemptive perspective, absolutely. There's, there's a because there was there was more revelation given. So Abraham did not understand all of the the intricacies of redemption, right? So even Jesus will say that John the Baptist is greater than everyone else, all the other prophets, but the least in the kingdom is greater than he. So there is this movement in redemptive and rev, revelation history, okay? But we can't say it's a different kind. We're not speaking of quality, but quantity. You see, the substance is there. Just like, so the, the big analogy is just like the flower, the flower seed and the flower, right? The seed contains fundamentally everything that the flower will become, but we don't yet see it. So I think this is just the best illustration to describe grace upon grace i one of one a very good one a very good one yeah excellent question thank you you're welcome any other questions or comments or i hope this is making sense oh yeah go ahead. Sir, yeah go yeah. ahead. Uh, 
the the grace that you're referring about Moses is that you you mean the grace in works is that the same uh, the way the, the law the law is just refers to the grace of works yeah because in Romans 11 it said uh, 11 I think verse 6 if I remember yeah. it is by grace it is uh, if, if it is by grace it is no longer on the basis of works otherwise yeah. grace is no longer grace so there's a works aspect in the law but mm -hmm. fundamentally you approach the law by faith there's sacrifice in the law and everything anticipates the coming of christ but those that were under the law had to be saved by grace so 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 look here so look here for being so yeah yeah it's higher yeah, yeah you said this a kind of jesus grace that you mentioned is uh, yeah, you see the, uh, the illustration. You show it. Uh, Christ is better than yeah. the 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 law, right? So yeah. my my point here uh, is that the law here is not being enforced. It's not being. It's not, it's, the law is being enforced here, right? Let's put the 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 Ten Commandments is being enforced. Is that yeah, still by grace or, or not? Yeah. So 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 remember, the law is always in force. The the grace part yeah. of the law. So so just to be clear. Only giving the law, Paul talks about this in Romans 7, only giving the law, within the law, there is no ability to do the law. And there is a, no atonement to cover the sins when you break the law. Mm -hmm. Is everyone tracking there? You're tracking there with me, right? So the yeah. law is always the law. The eternal law of God is there from the beginning until the end of time. Love God and love others. Everything else is commentary and context, okay? So uh, played out, and then, right? And yeah, that... that the idea is enforced, right? It, it yeah, should so be it, enforced. It's always enforced. So the, the amazing, question, yeah. By that enforcing, by that enforcing, is that grace or or not? No. So the enforcing of the law, that's law. That's justice. Grace is unmerited favor. Mercy okay. is not getting the penalty of the law. So so if you can think of it this way, Christ it, Christ atoned for our breaking of the law, so that now we can still do it, but we're covered by His grace. Mm -hmm. We're covered by his mercy. So let's I maybe mean, let's write some stuff down so, here. So okay. the, the grace by works here is out of con out out in that in this context in this line of uh, understanding. Yeah. So so no, but uh, so so the law was a gracious thing. God sharing with us mm -hmm. what is what is what He commands of us. That's a gracious thing. Okay. Right. But it does, but mm -hmm. but it's not sufficient to save. It doesn't okay. give us the power. It doesn't give us the power to over to do. All it does is says, "This is what God commands of you." You, you know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, so the law is gracious, but that's why what I'm trying to get at here is that if you're only seeing the law without the deeper grace behind and the work of Christ in. Old Testament saints. Yeah. Okay. That, that's why you have to understand the, 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 the cover of grace of being in effect. It's still in effect during this time period. Okay. That is because, because of the faith, because of the faith presence, the faith. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so, so people will talk about there's, there's a works principle in the law. And then there's also, there's also grace behind the scenes. And, and again, I would just come back to this, there is this old covenant administration, this new covenant, but the way that everybody is saved, whether in here or here, is through the work of Christ. Yeah, okay. So now I'm looking with the context of a covenant of grace. So yeah. in the old in the seventh, so uh, the old is kind of enforce grace, but here in the new covenant is kind of uh, is uh, voluntary. Is that? Uh, for those who only will accept Jesus, could could we say that, sir? No, because I mean, because we still—it's not voluntary. We're still commanded. We have to. We have to keep the law. It's just when we, whether old or New Testament, when we fail, we have Christ's atonement to cover us. Yeah. So 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 here's one thing to think about. So here's one thing to think about. This is why I'm saying type. So much of the Old Testament was a type. So much of the old law was a type pointing towards the fulfillment. So we have to we have to think about the old mm -hmm. the old 
covenant, just not in, in the command of God, but also that it's pointing, it's pointing to, it's pointing to the new covenant. That's the only thing that's eternal. So, so just to be clear, Jesus, and this is why maybe one day we'll have a book study in Hebrews. The author of Hebrews says, which I believe is Paul says that the shedding of, of the blood of bulls can never atone for sins. Never. Mm -hmm. So there is no way in the old covenant, if you just approached it at the let the written letter of the law, you could never receive salvation, but it was never intended to be like that mm -hmm. because it was fundamentally a type and it was pointing towards a greater reality. Mm -hmm. Someone in the old Testament, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, they approached the law by faith, recognizing that there was going to come an eternal sacrifice to which that sacrifice pointed to that would actually cover their sins. That's the extent to which they trusted. Do you see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so if all you did was approach the law by, I got to have this blood and sacrifice. That's why Jesus is like, I'm tired. That's why the Lord's like, I'm tired of your sacrifices. It means nothing. If there's nothing in the heart, they were just approaching it as if it was just, well, let's just do these works. Let's just do these outward signs and we're good to go. That's what the Catholic church does. Do these sacraments and you're good to go. And they're not dealing yeah. with the heart. And the so heart. what, yeah. and so the, here, the heart, the faith, it's always been there. Grace upon grace. It's always been there. It's how we've approached. Yeah. Is that making sense? Yeah. This is so deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's, like so a, it's like a razor blade, Jesus. And we have to have, we have to have multiple metaphors, multiple images, multiple understandings kept in mind as we approach these truths. This, we are, we are so deep right now. Okay. We're so deep. And I would yeah. not say that we would for, for even for even for, for everyone, this is not for everyone, but, but the importance here is understanding that salvation has always been by faith through grace. Always. We have here from Christ's fullness, we Israelite Gentile of all ages, apostles, prophets, church, we have all received grace upon grace for God gave his law through Moses. God has given grace and truth through Jesus Christ. And that existed from the garden. And then here's the concluding statement here. No one has ever seen God, not even Moses. Declaration here. And we're ending here. Declaration. No one has ever seen God. No one. The only son. Description. Location. The only son at the father's side. Some use bosom. Bosom. Intimate relationship. He. This one. Emphasis. He. Has made. God the father known revelation i guess you could you could have no this is an explanation here this is this is the the big conclusion because throughout john he's going to be fighting with the pharisees he's john is going to be fight he, jesus is going to be fighting with the pharisees the whole time and they're 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 looking at their interpretation and he's like no M moses is he, moses pointed to me, right? Moses pointed to me. Moses anticipated me. Read your scriptures. You think you have eternal life and they testified about me. This, this answers so many issues throughout John's gospel. Reread John's gospel in light of this. In light of this. It's going to open your eyes to why he fought so much with them. They were like, oh man, you know, you know, we got this scriptures are us. And Jesus like, no scriptures are on my side. And you're, you're, of, you're of Satan, the devil, right? my goodness, this is, this is so fundamental. So the, the last thing that we could even say here, and this is impl implicit, the law also testifies later in John's gospel. We're going to see this testifies to the son. So 
There is no excuse. The reliability is sure. And so here we have the great chain. We have the great chain. So look at this here. I'm going to do the great chain. We close on this, right? So God is in heaven. Father. Since. Son. No one has come up to seeing God. The only son has come down and reveals him. Okay. Watch this. So, so this, this is our, this is our, this is our lifeline. If it's not true, it's worthless. The whole message is, the, the whole message is corrupted, right? We need assurance here. And so what, what confirms this? Apostles, apostles, witness. What else confirms this? John. John's testimony. What else confirms this? So we're, we're his own testimony. The testimony of Jesus. So actually, Jesus says, "I will not testify." Jesus, Jesus actually does not testify because he's the one giving the message. So someone else has to testify. Now, Je Jesus is testifying to the truth that's here, but Jesus is not testifying about his own testimony. <laughs> Do you see what I'm no, saying? The, fa the Father. Yeah. No, that's correct. So we have. So no, that's really good, Danny. So we have apostle witness, John's witness. We have the law, the law's witness. And then we also have God, the father. So we have- This is my son. One, two. Yeah, this is my son. Three, four witnesses to the message. And this whole question on reliability, is it reliable? Yes. It is reliable. In the presence of two or three witnesses. Yeah. So here, let's come back to, let's come back to the big idea. And we'll, we'll close here. Big idea. The, the eternal word has become a man in order to bring God's presence to us fully, revealing the father to us, his person and will becoming a man, revealing God to us. His acts, his words, his power. The son is far greater than Moses. Now in this context, it's just these three, but for sure we could include God the Father. Jesus, his disciples, John the final OT prophet, and the law testify and confirm the son to us. And he reveals God's person and message to all of us.